This video looks at the stability of OMPC type of algorithms. Now it's clear from numerous examples in Chapter 3 that the expected behaviour of GPC and indeed the closed loop stability do not have a simple analytic link to the choice of horizons and indeed you could easily find examples where GPC was closed loop unstable. However, we did argue that if you used long horizons you tended to get a better synergy between predictions and behaviour and therefore more of an expectation of good closed loop behaviour. And in this chapter, we took that to extremes because we started looking at infinite horizons. But what we want to do now is say, can we actually give a more definitive result about stability rather than just an expectation? Now, in the previous video, we looked at what we needed in order to ensure a well-posed optimization. And what we said is the first requirement for expecting good a priori stability results is that your recursive decision making can be consistent from one sample to the next because if you can't be consistent then you may end up with chaos. Now in order to get this we said this requirement could be captured mathematically using the concept of the tail that is the part of the previous optimal strategy yet to be implemented and we basically said a well-posed MPC algorithm should include the tail in the class of predictions over which the optimization is performed. And the key thing, of course, is we showed that GPC, OMPC, and SOMPC all include the tail. So that bit's taken, and we don't need to keep revisiting it. Let's start then by looking at SOMPC, which is a suboptimal dual mode predictive control algorithm. What we're doing is we're taking the dual mode predictions based around the implementation and the key thing here is of an arbitrary regulator and some perturbations. So we had a transient mode, there it is, u equals minus kx plus c, and an asymptotic mode or terminal mode, u equals minus kx. And what we want to do is optimise predictive performance with respect to these perturbations c and implement the first value. So there's your typical performance index and essentially you want to minimise that over C. And the question we want to ask ourselves is, will this lead to a stabilizing feedback control law? So in other words, what can we say about the closed loop stability of this approach? Can we say anything at all? What we're going to do is we're going to look at the cost function and infinite horizons. So where people may be surprised is we're not going to calculate closed loop poles and try and find a link between pole positions and horizons and things. Instead, we actually look at the cost function. So OMPC and SOMPC deploy infinite input and output horizons in the performance index. So there it is. You can see I've got a sum from 0 to n, but in essence I'm taking n to be infinite. Now, for now, I'm using algebra, which is suitable for the CISO case, but the extension to the MIMO case is exactly equivalent. It just makes the algebra messier, which is why I've not done it. Now, a simple mechanism for investigating stability is to compare the solutions you get to minimizing this J at subsequent samples and have a look and see, is there any useful pattern? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, right, I've got J at K plus 1. Now that shouldn't be an n, again that should be an infinity. And what I'm going to do is exclude the double subscript for now, so I'm not basically saying what sample the decision was taken at. And what we want to do is first of all look at this j and see what we can say about it. And the key thing to start is to say this cost is bounded or finite, even though we're summing up over an infinite horizon. And the reason we know this is because by definition the terminal feedback u equals minus kx tells us that we have convergent errors and convergent inputs. So that's quite a useful start point. This j, which is our cost function, is bounded. Now what I'm going to do is compare this j at subsequent sample instance. And to start with I'm going to base my arguments around the tail because that makes it easier. So we'll assume that the optimization at sample k plus 1 chooses the tail from the previous sample. So here's the j I got at the first sample. And here's the j that I get at the next sample 
Now the key thing to notice, the only difference between these two, is that this one says k equals 0 to infinity, and this one says k equals 1 to infinity, because I've moved one sample forward. But otherwise, because we've assumed we're using the tail, they've got identical terms. So these e terms and u terms are identical in both of these performance indexes. Now, this gives us a very obvious and useful pattern, which tells us that j must be Lyapunov, because by comparing these two j's, I get this identity, that j k equals e1 squared plus lambda u0 squared plus j k plus 1. And you can see that because this one starts from k equals 1, this one starts from k equals 0. And what does that tell me? It tells me that j k plus 1 must be less than or equal to j k. And that's useful because j is made of a sum of squares, it's bounded, and it's also monotonically decreasing, and therefore it must be a Lyapunov function. And just as a reminder here, this value for jk plus 1 is an upper bound because we've assumed the tail. When you do an optimization, you may be able to make jk plus 1 even smaller. So what we've got is an interim summary. In the worst case, jk plus 1 equals jk, because you remember what we said was jk plus 1 is less than or equal to jk. So the worst case is that jk plus 1 equals jk. But in order for that to happen, we would have to have e equals u equals 0. If I go back to the previous page and you look at this identity at the bottom, the only way these two can be the same is if there's no e term and no u term. In other words, they both have to be 0. Now, if both e and u are 0, that can only happen repeatedly if you're already at the desired steady state with a 0 input. If e is not equal to 0 and or u is not equal to 0, then the inequality holds strictly. jk plus 1 must be less than jk, and so therefore j must be a Lyapunov function. J comprises squares of error terms, and therefore if J is metonically decreasing, then the errors must also be converging to zero. Now, I've given this proof fairly simply and quickly, but if you look in the literature, what you'll find is that this is the accepted proof for the convergence and stability of dual-mode predictive control algorithms. And the most interesting, useful thing is it applies to the nominal and also to the constrained case. So even though we've not introduced constraints yet, this proof applies even when you have constraints, and that makes it very powerful indeed. Now for completeness, what I'm going to do is just add some slightly fuller notation to show that this proof can also be applied with slightly different performance indices. So let's assume that we had input predictions a bit like this, U future, and output predictions a bit like this, so that's the standard notation. Now if at k plus 1 we assume that we're going to choose the tail, then what we're going to get is u k plus 1 at k plus 1 is the same as u k plus 1 at k, u k plus n at k plus 1 is the same as u k plus n at k, y k plus 2 at k plus 1 is the same as y k plus 2 at k, and so on. So that's our assumption about if we assume that the predictions at subsequent samples basically ride on the tail. Now let's look at a more GPC type of performance index. Here's one where you see we have a set point R and a Y. So we're looking at tracking error and we've got delta U's rather than U's. And we can use the same principle as before. Let's look at J at sample K. There it is. And compare it to J at the next sample. And what's the key difference? The key difference is this one had k plus i, this one had k plus i plus 1. This one had k plus i, this one had k plus i plus 1. So if you compare these two j's, this is what you get. jk plus 1 equals jk minus e squared, k plus 1 at k, and lambda delta u squared, where it was at time k. And so in other words, j is always reducing unless r equals y and delta u equals 0. So it's the same argument as before. Unless you are already at the desired steady state, then this j will keep getting smaller. Now this proof 
also applies during constraint handling. The only difference during constraint handling is that J is minimized subject to constraints, but you can still ride on the tail and therefore the same arguments follow automatically. If predictions at time K satisfy constraints, then so does the tail. And hence the tail can still be used at k plus 1 and therefore the Lyapunov property must still hold. There is however a need for feasibility, that is you have to assume that there exists at the outset a prediction class which satisfies constraints and that's a more technical argument which we'll revisit in later videos. Now the proof will also apply if you have a finite input horizon. That is what you have in GPC because essentially we use the input horizon was NU. Now you can do this in a very simple way by going through the steps of the proof if you want and altering the costing horizon on the inputs to be NU. But there is other ways. Okay? You could equally argue that J is the same as one gets from an infinite input horizon anyway as in effect all you've done is added a constraint that certain values are zero. But I'm going to leave that to you because that's really straightforward to show that that's the case. Key thing to remember, however, is that the output horizon must be infinite in general, because unless you have deadbeat responses, which I'm going to ignore because that would be really rather unusual, then the outputs only converge asymptotically. So you can choose the inputs to converge in finite time. You can say, I'm just going to move the input and keep it still. But with the outputs, because they're subject to system dynamics, they will tend to converge asymptotically. So you always need an infinite output horizon. Some conclusions then. Two conditions ensure that a predictive control law is guaranteed stabilizing in the closed loop. And that's a very powerful statement I've not made yet. That if you use OMPC or SOMPC, you are guaranteed stabilizing in the closed loop, for the nominal case, that is. And you could argue that these conditions, to some extent, ensure a well-posed optimization. And because you've got a well-posed optimization and you've got consistent decision making from one sample to the next, it's not unsurprising that you have a good expectation of good closed loop behavior. So the conditions you require, the prediction class must include the tail, and the input and output horizons in the performance index should be infinite. Although the control horizon and the number of degrees of freedom need not be infinite, you can have a finite number of degrees of freedom and that does not affect these proofs. Now, as a warning here, um, something we might discuss in a later chapter, if you have an open loop, unstable process, then you can't just willy-nilly use an infinite output horizon because your um, predictions may be divergent. So in that particular case, you have to use a dual mode approach. You have to first stabilize before you predict.